Close enough, Rodney. Yeah, critical people. I mean, you can take that different ways. <laughs> I, I guess we've experienced that in several different ways. President Perrin, that was a wonderful report, a wonderful presentation. And uh, there, I'm sure, have been other presidents in our history who would have wished to have been able uh, to offer such an encouraging view of the future. Thank you. <coughs> William Faulkner wrote in Requiem for a Nun, the past is not dead. It is not even the past. There are people and dates in what I'm about to say, uh, all of them in the past, but the past lives on in our institution in ways that if it fades at all, it fades slowly. I'm going to talk about three people whose lives are incarnate in this university. Three people whose essence, whose essence has become our own. The first, of course, is Dr. F.W. Maddox, born in 1909 in Ward County near Monahans. He was the third of seven children, born to a mother, Irene, who was the first of 13 children, by the way, who for her whole life was an elemental force, spiritually, intellectually, and in Oklahoma City, politically. As a young woman, she attended the University of Chicago. She met the famous Jane Addams of Hull Hall, uh, I'm sorry, Hull House, who sparked her interest in social action. Beginning in the 1940s, she was in constant demand as a speaker to women among churches of Christ and was designated by the Christian Chronicle Outstanding Woman of the Century among churches of Christ. Maddox's father, named Judge, believe it or not, well, my machine is not operating properly here, but perhaps a slide of Judge will come up in a moment was plagued over his lifetime by plain bad luck in his many attempted occupations. In Oklahoma, Judge Maddox preached on the side and was a purveyor of premillennial views, propagated in a monthly paper which he published in his garage at a time when the Churches of Christ were in the process of building formidable barriers against such people holding that point of view a view to which F.W. Maddox subscribed as a young man before he was gently dissuaded by J.N. Armstrong, about whom I will say more later. F.W. was Fount William, Fount William, named for his grandfather, Fount Livingston, Fount Livingston F.L. Young, who set the bar high as a princely evangelist and preacher said to be the only preacher among Churches of Christ with a bachelor's degree in the state of Texas at one point in time. Fount William was Billy to his family and friends. Brother Maddox to the churches he served, Brother Maddox to the colleagues and students that he had at Harding. He was my mother-in-law's brother Billy, my wife's uncle Billy. And though it took a while for me to make the adjustment and the many family reunions I attended after age 23, no one was ever heard to call him Dr. Maddox. He was consistently addressed as Dr. Maddox only in Lubbock. He came to Los Angeles to perform our wedding in 1967. He had married Emily's parents in 1938. He was Emily's favorite uncle and was her choice to do the wedding. Of course, I was honored, but before the two of us went out to watch the bride and the wedding party walk down the aisle, he took me by the lapel and offered me the option he said he offered every groom before going out to await the bride. It's not too late to back out. 
I will be glad to go out and explain that to the audience if you want to do it. At that point, he was still Dr. Maddox to me. And he was dead serious. He lived most of his youth in Oklahoma City, where he was the difficult child in the family, self-described as rebellious, adventurous, curious, inventive, preoccupied, and deeply committed to going his own way. He had significant problems with spelling and punctuation all his life, and that, coupled with his aggressive lack of interest in school, suggests he may have had what? A learning disability. He dropped out of high school for two years, concealing it from his large family for some of that time, and was sent to finish at Harding Academy to be reformed in Morrillton, <laughs> Arkansas in 1927. Before going to college, before attending Harding College for two years, he married Mildred Formby. He was married twice. He was married to Mildred, who was three years older than he was in 1929. She died in December 1988. And to Reba Berryhill, four years younger than he, in April 1989. Yes, uh, his wife Mildred died in 88 in December, and he married Reba Berryhill four months later. Way to go. After Harding. <laughs> He struggled long through his BA from Central State Teachers College in Edmond in 1934, his MA from the University of Oklahoma in 1940, his PhD from George Peabody College in 1947. He did all that while preaching for several churches in Oklahoma, spending two years preaching for a Los Angeles church while teaching history and social studies at Pepperdine College. You're not required to have worked at Pepperdine before becoming Lubbock Christian University's <laughs> president, but it apparently helps. And he had two different periods of employment at Harding, leaving his position of Dean of Students, Dean of Admissions, and Professor of Church History all at the same time uh, to come to Lubbock in 1956. As to Maddox's preaching, Bill Love, uh, in his 1992 history of Restoration Movement preaching, the core gospel, wrote that in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, F.W. Maddox was notable for being one of the few Church of Christ preachers who saw the cross as central and preached the saving grace of God in Jesus Christ. Maddox was born into what Tom, Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation, a future-oriented, cognitive, systematic, optimistic, self-starting builders who came of age during the Great Depression and World War II. He had a spirit of independent self-reliance. He wrote to Reba Berryhill in 1989 before they married, I love this feeling of independent self-sufficiency and no dependency upon other human beings. <laughs> of course, he said, all is from God upon whom we rely for every good thing. We also need people for no man is an island but I am speaking of dependency on others. To have this kind of security adds greatly to general happiness. His own independent spirit was reflected in what he expected of others. Example, he lived during the administrations of four successive presidents of Love a Christian. Uh, in the way he related to all of us, he was unfailingly true to his expectation that everyone should value independence and self-sufficiency with no dependency upon other human beings. He believed that everyone should bear their own crosses in the way that he did. If we expressed feelings as successors of insufficiency, his facial expression said in reply to our stated difficulties, well, life is hard, isn't it? <laughs> You've got problems, I had problems, I dealt with my problems, you can deal with yours. <laughs> it was a part of his character to stand on his own two feet, to face joy and sorrow, success and failure without trying to explain it or without complaining to anyone. 
And about 1992, we visited him in Searcy, and his big news that day was that while reading quietly a few days before, his heart had stopped. <laughs> of course, he said, I got it going again. <laughs> How? <laughs> was my astonished question. Oh, I just beat on my chest until it started up. You have to take responsibility for your own health. <laughs> He wasn't making it up. It's what he believed had happened. And he was proud that he had not called 911. He could even save his own life. He left Lubbock in 1974, probably saddened by the diminished esteem of faculty, staff, and board, yes. But he never let on. He did not return until about 1980. After that, he was back more frequently and was welcomed warmly. LCU's presidents were always glad to see him, glad that he was re-engaging with us. We were grateful just for his presence because it reminded all who watched that we had greatness, at least in our past. During challenging times, I thought about his legacy and realized that it was one thing to step into a succession of presidents and manage an institution, and quite another thing to start with nothing, as he did. But sitting with him at a basketball game one time, he proudly described to me the way in which the Fieldhouse, now the Rhodes Perrin Recreation Center, had been moved from Los Alamos and how it was reassembled here. I said to him, I can't imagine what it must have been like to put this campus together and work through all the difficulties of getting through the 18 years of your presidency. You must have been in constant prayer. And he replied, no, not really. <laughs> I knew God was aware of our needs, uh, that he already knew what we needed better than I did. When he led in the selling of bonds, incurring millions of dollars in long-term debt to advance into a four-year program, the board was uneasy. Someone said to him, Billy, how on earth do you expect us to pay those bonds off? Oh, he said, don't worry. Maybe the Lord will come before we have to pay them off. <laughs> An interesting mixture of self-reliance and trust in God's promise, providence. Who was he really? And what was he really like? In a 1989 letter to Reba Berryhill, he asked rhetorically, what kind of person is F.W. Maddox? And listed a set of interests and activities to answer his question. His list reveals that he saw himself in terms of action rather than what we might have done, listing personality traits. Here's his list. Church and college. Gardening. Making cooking wine. <laughs> Beekeeping, cooking, canning, entertaining, mechanical interests. And then in parenthesis, for some time I have been working on a device to harvest the power of the ocean to generate electricity, which might provide a concept for further explor exploration by others. <laughs> Seventh, church buildings both financing and construction, and eighth, general brotherhood interests. He concluded his letter to her with a list of true, what we would see as greatest generation characteristics, and generally said, I try to be responsible, dependable, self-controlled, cooperative, reliable, unselfish, and kind. His privately printed autobiography, The Future is Better Than the Past, has a chapter entitled, what kind of man, describing himself under four headings, none introspective. Maybe we could get another slide up. The headings are as a preacher, as a handyman, as a gardener, and flattering descriptions by others. I assume, Paula, that we have a couple of copies of the book in our library, if anybody's interested. In that last section, flattering descriptions uh, by others, after a preacher, handyman, and gardener, 
uh, are reprinted words of commendation taken from citations of honorary doctorates from Oklahoma Christian in 1973, Pepperdine in 1980, an article by Joe Barnett published in the Broadway Church of Christ Bulletin um, recognizing his 1974 retirement and an encomium spoken by me in 1987 as we named the administration building for him. He loved animals and was confident around horses, mules, and cattle. He dreamed of supporting Lubbock Christian by building a breeding herd of Santa Gertrudis cattle. He expressed intense disappointment in his autobiography that after his departure, they were sold by the pound for beef. <laughs> I, mean, I, I could understand that, but uh, at, a, at age 90, he wrote and distributed uh, something called The Dogs of My Life. This is a copy of the pamphlet, uh, The Dogs of My Life, dedicated to his descendants, who, he wrote, likely will never follow a coon dog at night or run jackrabbits with greyhounds. He wrote of his life as a boy with dogs, lots of dogs. And this is what he said. Most of the time, I lived with a guilty conscience, but my love for dogs seemed more than my love for family. The only time I ever saw resentment in his demeanor was when at a family reunion he recounted how when he was just 14 years old, his father had without consulting him given away his male and female white greyhounds and their 13 pups. He was over 80 years old when he told this story and he was still angry. <laughs> His engagement with campus construction is legendary. That was what you heard about this morning. It, 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 people will tell stories about seeing F.W. Maddox in his coat and tie, you know, digging down in a hole. I mean, that's what people think of. Once when he was praised for how much physical labor he contributed, he said he just needed the exercise. The truth was he did it because he wanted to. He was supremely comfortable with and comforted by working with his hands. It was, perhaps as much as anything else, who he was. And he did it because he had to. In our early days, the bench was not deep, and there was work to be done. That was consistent with his earlier life in Oklahoma City when he supervised and worked on the construction of the church building for which he was preaching full time. Later, he took a job at Harding, 1942, where the job description was first renovating a building into a men's dormitory, which he then with his family lived in and supervised while teaching 18 hours of physical education, directing intramurals, and supervising all student workers. <laughs> he did much of the construction and all of the finishing of his home in Searcy in 1947. It was his farm near Searcy that nearly kept him from coming to Lubbock to be president of the new college. He mourned, really mourned, leaving that place, where in his words, I had coon dogs and took college boys hunting at night. I had all for which one could wish and had it all under control. I planned to continue in this happy, contented lifestyle until I became an old college professor at Harding. But he came with a truckload of books he had traded his farm for, books that became the core of the new Lubbock Christian College Library, and some of which are still in our collection. And he rather proudly says in his autobiography he was never compensated for this. <laughs> he was recruited by three men who flew to Searcy in December 1955 to see him. Don Baldridge piloted the plane. Don, Paul Sherrod, and Skipper Ship, all founding board members, barely persuaded him to just come to Lubbock for a visit. He had just turned down an invitation to be York College's first president, but he came to Lubbock and met a large gathering of people whose assignment it was to impress him with their commitment to build a college. They affirmed the need for a college in his hearing uh, they co confirmed the commitment of the churches and their determination to raise the $500,000 that would launch the college. He was moved to say in response that while he felt he knew how to launch and build a college, he thought it might take a million and a half dollars. 
Uh, but he said, I'm not a fundraiser. And they replied with one voice, don't worry, we will raise the money. A digression here. My friend Charles Seibert used to say, search committees don't lie, don't mean to lie, but they just do. <laughs> but that night his doubts were removed when one of the most wealthy and respected men in the group rose to say, brethren, we are thinking too small. We are God's people, and anything God's people undertake will succeed. Instead of just raising one and a half million dollars, we can raise three million dollars. That man's vision and forcefulness convinced Dr. F.W. Maddox to sign on. That man was Billy Saul Estes. <laughs> If that name doesn't mean anything to you, he was a wealthy and successful man who was at that very moment involved in planning illegal schemes to become even wealthier. It caught up with him in a few years after this and he served a total of six years in prison, left behind many ruined people, and he never gave a penny, legitimately acquired or ill-gotten in support of the new college. You can't make these things up. <laughs> you might expect his autobiography to be mostly about his sojourn in Lubbock, which was surely his life's greatest accomplishment. But to the contrary, it is fascinating to see that out of 211 pages, only 38 pages are allocated to his time here. But 67 of those 211 pages describe his courtship of Reba Berryhill, with their letters quoted in loving detail, nearly one-third of the book's content, way too much information. <laughs> but what he did here, what he did here was huge. In 1956-57, he found the land, supervised construction, and did some of it himself, assembled the founding faculty of 13, hired a few staff, recruited the first student body of about 120, and launched an unaccredited junior college. And we know that in 1974, 18 years later, he left a growing donor base, a faculty and staff of 110, well, a faculty and staff of 110, and a student enrollment in an accredited four-year college of around 1,000. The dormitories and all but two of the mainframe buildings now standing on this central campus were built during his time. He planned this campus. He planned its width, its depth, and all of its right angles. All of it was his plan. There is no doubt that for the first 18 years, the institution was, and in many ways still is, an extended shadow of the man. In the 27 years he lived after Lubbock, the 27 years he lived after Lubbock, he built with his own hands most of a church building in Wilmington, North Carolina, and preached for that church for five years, and encouraged a young member of that church named Mike Cope to pursue ministry. He and Mildred moved for a year to Searcy, returned to Wilmington in 1980, while he preached for a church in Shalott, North Carolina for nine years. Mildred's decline into Alzheimer's disease may have, become, may have begun in the late 1970s. He cared for her in every detail in their home until her death. Try the next slide, please. After Mildred's death, he looked to the future. And within weeks, he contacted the long-widowed, lovely and lively Reba Berryhill. She was an old Circe friend of Mildred's. Uh, to, uh, and he wanted to learn whether she might, whether Reba might be willing to consider marriage. He conducted a letter writing campaign that is documented for all of us to see in his autobiography. As I mentioned, his campaign was successful and he moved at age 80 to Searcy upon marrying Reba. He lived out his life in service to the University Church of Christ in Searcy, gardening, giving great attention to his and Reba's grandchildren and great-grandchildren 
made occasional trips back to Lubbock to appear in chapel on campus and visit family and usually to preach on a Sunday morning at Greenlawn, his beloved home church in Lubbock. He died, next slide please, in, 20, in 2001, 2001, nearly 92. After spending nearly a year in a difficult recuperation from a broken neck, Ken Jones and I were invited to conduct his funeral in Searcy. The children born to Billy and Mildred are Patty Bryant and Dr. Joe Maddox, both of whom are still living, outstanding people in their own right. Reba died in 2009 at 96. In the year 2000, during the celebration of the Avalanche Journal's 100th anniversary, he and Mildred were featured in the newspaper series called First Families of Lubbock. I don't know whether he ever knew about that. He never mentioned it. The second of these three essential people in Lubbock Christian University's identity is Casey Mosier, born Kenny Carl Mosier, near Johnson City, Texas, in 1893. He was the son of a man who made his living as a farmer, but who was himself an evangelist. I found his picture in a book called Gospel Preachers Who, Gospel Preachers Who Blaze the Trail that I have in my personal library, a picture of Casey Mosier's father. I owe some of what I will say to John Mark Hicks, who has done extensive work on the life and influence of this man. Much of what I will say is based on personal experience and conversations with old classmates, F.W. Maddox, Emily's class notes, I lost mine, interviews with <laughs> artist Mosier, his wife, and Fran Winkles. Maddox was strongly influenced during his student days by Harding's president, J.N. Armstrong, and he believed he could duplicate Armstrong's irenic, Christ-centered, grace-endowed perspective for students of Lubbock Christian College by bringing in his longtime like-minded friend, Casey Mosier. Slide, please. I guess this is it. In 1964, at 71 years old, he came to teach at Lubbock Christian College, 71 years old. He had been a preacher all his life who, though he did not know it at this time, would ultimately be credited with the eventual development of an important uh, soteriology and Christology shared widely in the Stone Campbell movement to this very day. Much of what he advocated here in the 1960s and 70s was first expressed in 1925 when he wrote what Hicks calls his basic position which he never surrendered. Mosier's 1925 affirmation, 1925 affirmation was that sinners are saved when faith has completely manifested itself in leading them to obey the Lord through baptism as an expression of that faith. Baptism, however, he said, is not what saves. Faith in Jesus Christ saves as the principle which underlines, underlies baptism. I recognize that contemporary scholarship may view Mosier's central message as simplistic, lacking in recognition of the entire biblical narrative as a revelation of the grace of God, lacking a larger view of the purpose and place of the book of Romans. And I also know that today's students are seeking different answers have different questions than students in the 1960s and 70s. Paul's question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, might be answered by today's incoming students with, it all depends, or sure, why not? But Mosier, just as we are, was a product of his times, or perhaps I should say a product in reaction to his times. We who were students here were largely products of small churches of Christ on a line south of Oklahoma City, west of Abilene, to the western borders of New Mexico, southern Colorado. A sad theology was sometimes preached in that rectangle about such things as baptism. I had, in my own 19-year-old northwest New Mexico mind, the words of an admired preacher of my youth who from the pulpit explained the whole rationale for baptism in these words. All we need to know is that the Bible says to be baptized. He tells us to be baptized in water, but if he had told us to be baptized in milk, we would be baptized in milk, period. 
My mother was outraged by that. She told me so on the way home. But whatever the pew may have thought about it, the pulpit had another view. John Mark Hicks tracks Mosier's views to the time he spent with R.C. Bell, a, a Nashville Bible School product and a faculty member at Thorpe Spring Christian College. Mosier was Bell's student at Thorpe Spring. He graduated and then served, actually served as a colleague on the Thorpe Spring faculty for a year. Mosier and Maddox shared a history. They had preached in Oklahoma City at the same time. Mosier following Maddox, the 12th and Drexel Church in 1940. Casey and his wife Artis were Irene Maddox's fast friends, Billy's mother's fast friends. Billy Maddox knew that Mosier had been very ill, was deeply discouraged at 71, feeling useless, and he hoped that bringing Mosier to love a Christian would help revive his health and his sense of purpose. To summarize the decades of Mosier's life as a preacher, he began in the 1920s with respected positions on the writing staffs of the Texas-based Firm Foundation and the Nashville-based Gospel Advocate. A hardening of positions took place in those years, and the editors of those publications excluded Mosier, incriminating him for what seemed to them to be heretical views. And though he was still able to preach, there were few places where he was welcome. By the mid-1930s, he had been hounded into virtual obscurity and labeled a dangerous force among Texas and Oklahoma churches of Christ. Mosier's daughter, Fran Winkles, told me that he was deeply distressed by the personal, vindictive, printed attacks by people who insisted that the, the so-called plan of salvation, by which they meant the formulaic hearing, faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, was one and the same with the core gospel. In 1932, G.H.P. Showalter of the Firm Foundation wrote that he had delivered what he called a knockout blow to Mosier's solar plexus. That may have been even truer than Showalter knew as Mosier suffered sometimes near death with ulcerative colitis for the next five years. In terms of direct influence, by 1964, when he came, Mosier appeared to be a spent force. I remember the vitriol of an Oklahoma preacher who was holding a meeting in a Los Angeles church in my student days there, probably 1966. He learned that I had been at Lubbock Christian College and said, I hope you didn't take any classes from K.C. Mosier, and then launched into a shocking litany of anger at Maddox and Mosier for their likely destruction of what he called the truth. Yet, Maddox told me that he had no revolutionary purpose in hiring Mosier. He had long before embraced Mosier's emphasis on grace, faith, the person and work of Jesus Christ, and they were not new views, not new views in the Stone Campbell movement. David Lipscomb, a name that will mean something to some of you, taught the assumptions at Nashville Bible School, passed those assumptions on to people like J.N. Armstrong. Another, another, uh, the next slide, please. Who was Harding's president during Maddox's student days. Maddox said that Armstrong had a, this is his quote, a clearer non-sectarian view than any man I have ever known, so that throughout my life, I also have taught and worked to keep the church from division over things which are not essential to salvation. But these views were found more often in churches of Christ east of the Mississippi, less so in Texas West. Maddox had long preached Armstrong and Mosier's views in Arkansas, Oklahoma, and West Texas and was widely accepted, perhaps because of his own personality, his character. Maddox told me that he thought most Lubbock Christian College constituents in 1964 would accept Mosier and that he could defend Mosier's appointment. He said, in 1964, I thought the church was ready for Mosier. Maddox's courage was demonstrated in Mosier's appointment, but I do not think he would have brought Mosier to the college had he thought it would endanger the institution. Interestingly, Jimmy Allen's undergraduate class in Romans at Harding was using Mosier's book, The Gist of Romans, little green copy of right here, uh, using that in the 1950s and the 1960s. And 
the Lubbock environment was favorable to Mosier's coming in 1964. Uh, G.C. Brewer was Broadway's venerated preacher, 1937-1944. He was a product of Nashville Bible School and preached a Christ-centered, a, a, a Christ, um, hmm, yeah, I'm still on track, a Christ-centered gospel of grace and non-sectarian ecclesiology, though he had a pronounced polemic edge that sometimes obscured that. Next slide, please. This is a slide of Mosier, who is on your left in about 1937, and G.C. Brewer. If you notice a slight resemblance between G.C. Brewer on the right and Perry Mason, it's because he is Perry Mason's grandfather. Mosier had preached in Morton, and he lived in Idaloo uh, during, broad, uh, during uh, uh, Brewer's Broadway years. And he was Brewer's friend. They, along with J.D. Thomas, does that name mean anything to anybody? J.D. Thomas, anybody? Yeah, a few of you. Who was then Lubbock's city manager, soon to go pursue a PhD uh, at the University of Chicago, and then to join Abilene's, Abilene Christian's Bible department, where he worked for 30, 40 years and was chair of that department for a good part of that time. The three of them formed a friendship that likely helped Mosier recover from a life-threatening illness and probably helped shape a theology of grace for all three. Thomas assigned the gist of Romans. Thomas, not in this picture, but J.D. Thomas assigned the gist of Romans to his Abilene Christian students in the late 1950s and 1960s. Maddox felt that he could defend his choice of Mosier. Broadway's minister following G.C. Brewer in 1944 and until 57, 1957, when Lubbock Christian started, was Norval Young. His father and mother had both attended Nashville Bible School and knew David Lipscomb. From an early age, Norval had heard the preaching of Hall Calhoun at Nashville's Belmont Church of Christ. Calhoun was a Harvard PhD in New Testament who had also studied under J.W. McGarvey. Is that a name that means anybody, anything to anybody? So Norval too was debtor to the Stone Lipscomb perspective that was a part of the Restoration Movement. Perhaps Brewer and Young, both highly respected, took off some of the hard Texas edge of the Restoration Movement in this region and helped prepare the way for Maddox and Mosher to have further influence. Indeed, there were some who objected to Mosier's employment at Lubbock Christian. There was a small student walkout from one of his classes in the first year. Uh, and Maddox received letters from people who said he had hired a Baptist on the faculty. <laughs> Maddox was not impressed. What was this revolutionary message uh, that Mosier had? Next slide, please. From Emily's class notes on that taken day one of Mosier's uh, Romans class, I see that he asks what he calls some personal questions, including, can you explain why an atonement for sin was necessary? Can you exp uh, what does faith in Christ mean to you? With what do you most usually associate the expression, the remission of sins? Do you consider your salvation a precarious blessing? As students, we were immersed into the words of Romans and Galatians that explain those hard-ridden proof texts of Acts 2.38 and the Great Commission. We heard, most of us for the first time, exposition of sin, guilt, atonement, the cross, grace, faith, justification, sanctification, and glorification. He challenged us autobiographically, I know now, and these are his words in Emily's notes, stand for something vital something you count more dear than your own life, and then went on to say that Acts 20, 24 was his vital cause. I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task, the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. He told us, his quote, if you understand the cross, you will understand that you don't earn your salvation. Indeed, you cannot, he said, earn your salvation. 
We memorized Romans 1, 16 through 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. And he told us that the righteousness of God is God's saving power, not an attribute of God. It is a gift of God to the believer, he said. It is God's justification, a state of being declared righteous by God. He told us that faith was not believing facts, but trusting in Jesus as Savior. He said, we are saved in the name of Christ. To our relief, we learned you don't fall away from grace by sinning. You fall away from grace by turning back to the law. He said, boys and girls, we just need to catch up with our hymns. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. The preacher of my youth that I mentioned earlier had derided those who say we cannot live perfect lives. He once said, if you can be perfect for one second, I heard this, I grew up on this, folks. He once said, if you can be perfect for one second, you can be perfect for a minute. If you can be perfect for a minute, you can be perfect for an hour. If you can be perfect for an hour, you can be perfect for a day. And he went on. Well, in my case, I knew that all was lost after the first second. <laughs> but Moser relieved, uh, re relieved that tension when he said, even our obedience must have a savior because it's imperfect. Obedience isn't the cause of my salvation. Christ is the cause. He said, law and works are powerless to save or to improve. Grace and faith save and sanctify. Choose, either go to the law and serve that perfectly or throw yourself on the grace of God. Choose. Commonplace now, but a radical message for most of us then igniting faith in many of us. As I was talking to one of my old classmates about Mosier, he said, I accepted these new ideas because he was soft, humble, quiet, not argumentative, patient, never ridiculed anyone for misunderstanding him. His message was capsuled in a personality that was wholly winsome and spirit-filled. Another slide, please. He was lean, tall, had a face that suggested suffering and deep seriousness. He spoke softly and rapidly without much inflection, usually sat when he taught behind a desk, rising occasionally to write on the blackboard. We had occasional flashes of wit from him and always found him approachable. Listen to the tone of his inscription in my 1964-65 yearbook. And I noticed that the only faculty member I went to to inscribe it was Casey Mosier. Here's what he wrote. It has been a distinct pleasure to have you in my classes. You have learned facts, but you have a fine understanding of the facts. I'm sure that in your preaching that you will, like Paul, preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. On occasions, you might be criticized, but whatever cross one must bear, one should consider it an honor to bear it for Christ's sake. May the Lord bless you down throughout the years. Sincerely, Casey Mosher. Uh, that is an even more wonderful benediction for me now than it was 48 years ago. He became a popular speaker at national meetings of the campus evangelism movement among Churches of Christ College, uh, among uh, Church of Christ College students, and was invited to speak at the Abilene Christian University World Mission Workshop in the fall of 1972. I was there as a faculty sponsor for a group of Pepperdine students. On the final night after 11 o'clock, Mosier was introduced to probably 2,000 2, students in Moody Auditorium. Now 78 years old, he stood straight and tall in a robin's egg blue suit and delivered this same message of faith, grace, justification, the person and work of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God that I had heard as a student. The students were mesmerized by this old man with the new wine of the gospel. He said, I've waited 40 years to speak at Abilene Christian University. Now they're letting me do it, but they wouldn't let me get up until nearly midnight. I wonder if they're trying to tell me something. <laughs> Not comprehending some of the pain that might have been behind those words, 
The students caught his spirit of fun, and those of us who knew something of his history understood that it was actually an important moment for him. I suspect that the scholarly attention given Mosier during the last 20 years would not have developed so fully had he not spent his last decade of life at Lubbock Christian College among the churches of Lubbock and before the students who attended campus mobilization seminars in the 1960s and 1970s. F.W. Maddox's unassailable reputation was placed alongside Mosier and his inclusion in a mainstream Church of Christ institution signaled the acceptability of his life's work to many who were weary of the legalistic controversies of the 40s and uh, 50s and 60s. He knew what it meant. His daughter Fran Winkle said those years were very important to him as he consciously influenced a generation of college students and his wife Ardis said that he thought passing his ideas along to several generations of college students the most important thing he had ever done. His work spread well beyond the confines of our campus and student groups. John Mark Hicks wrote, Mosier led a renewal of grace-oriented teaching in Churches of Christ, and by the early 1960s, he had come to be an influential leader among those churches. During the last 20 years, he's been given a place of significance in the Stone Campbell scholarship of Richard Hughes, Leonard Allen, Bill Love, Mike Casey, John Mark Hicks, and Doug Foster. And he has an entry with a photograph in the 2004 publication of the Encyclopedia of the Stone Campbell Movement. When he spoke at the funeral of F.W. Maddox's mother in 1970, Mosier said in his laconic way, Irene was a sinner and she knew it. Irene had a savior and she knew it. I spoke those same words about Artis Mosier when I helped conduct her funeral in 1990. Kenny Carl and Artis Mosier chose burial at Rest Haven Cemetery, located within sight of Lubbock Christian University and the Green Lawn Church of Christ, both of which had provided them a haven of love and esteem unequaled anywhere else in their storied, storied pilgrimage. We feel his influence still in the way we have expressed our faith for decades. The Casey Mosier Award is presented to alumni for service to the church at our Mosier Ministry Conference, which begins in 41 days. Presenters will be Drs. Ron Highfield, Jim Martin, and Jeff Carey. Any message of freedom in Christ that they might proclaim in this place owes something to convictions held by Maddox and Mosier so long ago. Next slide, please, for the last and shorter part of this presentation. Third in this trilogy of essential people is J.E. Hancock. Can we get another slide up? A member of our board of trustees. In personality, philosophy, and complexity, he is easier to comprehend than our first two, but no less important to who we are today. He was, Lubbock, he was a Lubbock Christian University trustee from 1967 until his death in 2004 at the age of 98. He was vice chairman of the board for several years. He was chairman of the board beginning in 1980 and until 1998. During Harvey Pruitt's time, he was the prime mover in the unique, remarkable water reclamation project, which ultimately became a major part of our present endowment. He was chair during all the time I was president and through five of Ken Jones' 19 years. Like F.W. Maddox, he was cognitive, systematic, optimistic, self-starting, a builder focused on the future. Born in 1905 in Sherman, where he went to school and only moved with his family to Tahoka when he was 18 years old. Next slide, please. He married Eileen Carruth in 1928, a woman, I think this is their 60th anniversary celebration, 1928, a woman most of us knew as having a penetrating personality in her own right, devoted to Jean, and clearly a true companion in all his activities. Also, much like F.W. Maddox, when Eileen had a debilitating stroke in about 1981, Jean made sure that she greeted all guests to their house, either in her hospital bed or in a wheelchair in their living room. As she lost her ability to interact with others, 
he employed daytime help and spent every night alone next to her bed from about 1986 until her death in 1992. He was a faithful caregiver and preferred to have all of his business conversations in front of her, though she may not have comprehended, nor could she contribute to the discussion. Still, he would punctuate his assertions looking at Eileen and saying, isn't that right, partner? Next slide, please. He looked to the future. At age 86, within a month of Eileen's death, he decided to have his eroding teeth, all of his eroding teeth, replaced with dental implants. It was a process that took several weeks of pain and discomfort. 86 years old, I thought, one day after a meeting, I asked, Gene, why did you decide to have this work done with all this trouble to you at this point in your life? And the question just confused him a little. Why, Steve, he said, I'm going to need these teeth. <laughs> then, not long after that, our family was returning from a Thanksgiving visit to my mother and Ranger. We turned into the Eastland McDonald's at about 7 o'clock on Monday morning, and there, walking into the McDonald's, were Jean, was Gene with Vita Ray Tatum. You may or may not have known Vita Ray. Uh, hand in hand. We knew Jean, and we knew Vita Ray, but together, hand in hand, we were stunned. I turned to Emily and said, should we go in too? And she said, absolutely not. <laughs> So we moved on. The next day, he came by my office, sat down, and said, Steve, I need to talk with you about something that is very personal and must be kept quiet for now. I said, let me guess, you're getting married to Vita Ray. He said, S have you been spying on me? <laughs> so I told him the story, and he said that they were returning to Lubbock after visiting his son's Dallas family to get their blessing. We had a good laugh, and he asked me to perform their wedding, which I did a few weeks later. He was skeptical of what he called the medical establishment, though his grandson, in whom he had great pride, was a physician. His grandson once stopped him, stopped Gene, from applying WD-40 to his hands for arthritis. He said, well, I've done it for years. It helps. His miracle drug was Bran a third cup of bran a day without fail. And who can argue with someone who used WD-40 for arthritis and ate bran and lived to be 98 in sound mind and good health? The first time I saw him, I was a freshman student. I was sent to sell him a yearbook ad at his place of business. I was completely intimidated when he said, you go tell Billy Maddox to come here himself if he wants to, me to buy a, a yearbook ad. <laughs> then he smiled and said, okay, where do I sign and when do I pay? They had two children, Betty and Bob. Betty was killed when her car was hit by a drunk driver in 1954. She was a beautiful, vital girl, and the Hancock family was devastated. Her picture is in the parlor. This building was funded by the Hancock's first significant gift to love a Christian. It was funded in Betty's memory, 1964. I was one of the students who saw him briefly at that groundbreaking. I didn't see him again until I came to interview to be dean of the college in 1978. President Harvey Pruitt told me that I would meet with the executive officers of the board, so I shaved my full beard in preparation. At the meeting, Harvey asked a couple of leading questions, turned to the trustees, and Gene asked the first and only question of the day. Steve, he said, do you still have the same, I mean, I'm 33 years old now, do you still have the same conservative philosophy that we taught you when you were a student here? It was the worst question he could have asked at that point in my life. Well, I, um, er, uh, depending on what you mean by conservative and, and in what area of law, and he said, oh, never mind. Your hair's the right length. I'm sure you're OK. <laughs> and that was the end of the interview. <laughs> Harvey got me out of the office just as quickly as he could. <laughs> Gene attended Wayland Baptist, graduated from Texas Tech, understood and believed in higher education. When we named the J.E. and Eileen Hancock College of Liberal Arts and Education, we honored them at a well-attended dinner. 
He stood to respond and said, Eileen and I are deeply honored by this. We don't feel deserving of the honor, but Steve, I wonder, couldn't you have this, couldn't you have, couldn't you have called it, couldn't you have called it the Jean and Eileen Hancock School of Conservative Arts? <laughs> Hmm. Well, um, what I will say now is that um, that uh, he he provided he provided the, the the impetus for what I mentioned earlier the water project the water conservation project, which was ultimately sold to the city of Lubbock, and that the proceeds from that are now a large part of our endowment and the Hancocks rem remain our most significant donors. His wealth emerged from his own inventive hands. While he was teaching agriculture and manual arts in the schools of New Home, Pettit, and O'Donnell, he was inventing a machine that would evolve into industrial equipment which he manufactured in his Hancock Manufacturing Company. His earth movers were used by Israel to dig an irrigation canal from the Sea of Galilee into the South Desert. At the end of his ownership, he held 18 patents and it sold 15,000 pieces of heavy equipment worldwide. He traveled the world over, knew every corner of the nation, but remained to the end of his life a representative West Texan. Proud of his region, his rough edges shaped by it and its people, proud of Lubbock Christian University, expecting greatness in its future. And what more should I say? We have a great cloud of witnesses behind us and around us. They are cheering us on with example and words of encouragement, maybe even running with us. If you listen, you may hear them. If you look, you may see them. Like them, for them, with them. We create, lead, endure, seek peace, and believe in something better. <laughs>